Hello and welcome to this Taylor Wetting webinar on the subject of the BOLAR and experimental use exemptions to patent infringement. This is a subject that arises frequently in practice and so in the next 45 minutes or so we are going to explain what is known about the activities that these exemptions cover in some key European jurisdictions and a little of what is not known, taking into consideration recent reforms in Poland and the new experimental use exemption in the UK along the way. For this purpose, we've gathered a whole team of Taylor Wessing patent experts from across Europe. I'll introduce them. These are Amanda Ebert, Senior Associate in London, Anja Luntzer, who is a partner in Munich, David Mulder, an Associate in our Amsterdam office, and Agnieszka Stoldman, a Senior Associate in Warsaw. My name is Paul England, and I'll be leading you through the discussion today, as well as asking one or two questions. And on that point, please note that you can submit questions of your own using the Q&A icon in the middle of your screens. I can't promise we'll get back to these uh, during the webinar, or answer them during the webinar, but we'll certainly get back to you by email as soon as we can afterwards, in any case. One more housekeeping point. At the end of the webinar, please hold on just for a moment for the survey that will pop up on your screen and fill it in. We find that feedback very helpful to decide on future webinar topics and how to improve them. Okay, so let's turn to the subject at hand and one thing that puzzles people. Why do we have experimental use exemptions and a BOLAR exemption? Uh, the answer to that lies in various shortcomings, if I can put it that way, which have been identified over time in the exemptions applying. In outline, the history is that the experimental use exemption, although based on the Community Patent Convention 1975, was and still is provided in national law by national statutes. And this means it varies from one European country to another not so much because of differences in the drafting, but because of different judicial interpretations in the national courts. In particular, although the experimental use exemption applies potentially to all technical subject matter that's capable of patent protection, including pharmaceuticals, there's doubt about the extent to which, if at all, protection is afforded by this exemption for the conduct of clinical, of clinical trials and other tests necessary to obtain a marketing authorization. This was a particular issue for generic pharmaceuticals who faced waiting until patent expiry before they could perform equivalent studies for the purpose of obtaining abridged marketing authorizations based on branded drugs, effectively extending monopoly protection for branded drug makers after patent expiry until the approval for the generic could be obtained. And as a result, the BOLAR exemption was implemented. Now this provision, which incidentally was named after a similar provision in US law drawn up following the Roche and BOLAR case, which is where it gets its name from, uh, and is sometimes also known as the regulatory review exemption this was introduced in the EU by Article 10, Paragraph 6 of Directive 2001-83, sometimes known as the Medicines Directive. And the wording of this is shown on the slide, so I won't read it out, but its purpose was specifically to address uncertainty about the scope of application of the experimental use exemption to bioequivalents and stability studies that were conducted for the purpose of obtaining an abridged marketing authorization on the basis of the already authorized branded drug under that directive. Now, although the directive is intended to harmonize legislation across the member states of the EU, as a directive, it must, of course, be implemented by the national laws of each country concerned, that is, it doesn't have direct effect. So this means that much like the experimental use exemption, there have been varying or 
really quite different actually implementations of BOLAR in the member states and we're going to show you what they are but first let's go back to the beginning um, and ask Amanda to take us through the UK experimental use exemption. Amanda. Uh, great, thank you very much Paul. Um, yes, so I will come on to the new experimental use exemption in the UK a bit later, but let's first consider what were the limitations of the original experimental use exemption, at least in the UK, that provided the need for BOLA in the first place. As Paul said, the original exemption has broad application to all subject matter, not just pharmaceuticals. In fact, the two leading cases in the UK are about agrochemicals. The first is the Court of Appeal decision in Monsanto and Staffa. In this case, the defendant sought the modification to an injunction that had been ordered against the manufacture and sale of their touchdown herbicide for agricultural use. The Court of Appeal permitted limited modifications to the injunction so that it didn't prevent the defendants from conducting experiments on touchdown in laboratories or glasshouses in the UK to find out more about it. But the court wouldn't allow field trials for the purpose of full commercial clearance from the Pesticide Safety Precaution Scheme and approval from the Agricultural Chemicals Approval Scheme and those bodies that existed at the time. Explaining where the line is to be drawn between exempted and non-exempted experiments under the original experimental use exemption, Lord Justice Dillon, the leading judge, explained as follows. Trials carried out in order to discover something unknown or to test a hypothesis or even in order to find out whether something which is known to work in specific conditions, e.g. of soil or weather, will work in different conditions, can fairly be regarded as, as experiments. The trials carried out in order to demonstrate to a third party that a product works or in order to amass information to satisfy a third party, whether a customer or a body such as the PSPS or ACAS, that the product works as its maker claims are not to be regarded as acts done for experimental purposes. In other words, the court reasons that exempted experiments are those that generate new knowledge. Those that verify existing knowledge, for example, for getting regulatory clearance, are not covered by the experimental use exemption. The later decision of the Court of Appeal in Alchenkloss is consistent with this when it holds that making and experimenting with a patented invention merely for the purposes of gaining official approval would not fall within the original UK experimental use exemption. The facts of the Arshan Cloth case again concern agrochemicals. In this case, a sample of a dry water-soluble biocidal composition was sent by the defendant to the MAFS, the old Ministry of Agricultural Fisheries and Food. Here the Court of Appeal held that Supplying a sample to the ministry in order to obtain official approval, rather than to discover something unknown or to test a hypothesis, was not covered by the exemption. Let's just add one more English case, shall we, which concerns a medical device. This is the Patents Court decision in Corval and Edwards Life Sciences. This case supports the view, in principle, that the original experimental use exemption permits trials to be conducted on a patented drug to ascertain its effect in non-patented medical indications. It's still held in this case that the trials at issue did not benefit from the exemption. The reason was that the activity in question was the supply of the defendant's valve device to selected hospitals as part of a clinical program to train cardiologists in the use of the device. Core valve invoiced a very substantial amount for this program and the judge thought that this illustrated an outer limit on the principle that a commercial motivation for the work is permissible as long as the preponderant purpose of the work is to find out something new. Finding out something new here was not the preponderant purpose. So in summary, the English authorities applying the original experimental use exemption draw a distinction between, on one hand, activity conducted for the purpose of discovering something new about the subject matter of the invention, and on the other hand, merely verifying what is already known. So to the extent, and this is a matter of fact in each case, that trials and tests on a substance for regulatory approval of that substance are not discovering something new, the exemption will not apply. In particular, it is generally accepted that this is the case as regards bioequivalent studies for an abridged application. These studies won't be protected under the original exemption, and it's very uncertain that full clinical trials would be protected either. 
Now, so how does this how does Bola help this situation in the UK? I'll just deal with it briefly now because while it is still on the statute books, the Bola exemption in the UK has effectively been superseded by the new experimental use exemption that we mentioned before. The UK implementation of Bola is linked by explicit reference to Article 10.6 of the Medicines Directive. Although there is no case law on the precise scope of the exemption, the UK IPO and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, known as the MHRA, have published a practice note to explain their understanding of the exemption. Their view is that UK bowler exempts from patent infringement only activities conducted by a generic for the purpose of obtaining an abridged marketing authorization and no more. The exempted test must also be for authorizations covering the European Union market and no wider. As a result, this is the widely accepted view of UK practitioners too. So, Paul, although the bowler exemption assists generic companies to overcome the restrictions of the original experimental use exemption, it is still very narrow. Okay, thanks, Amanda, very much for that. Uh, and I'm going to come back to you, aren't I, a little bit later to talk about the new experimental use exemption in the UK, uh, which I understand is much broader. But let's first go to Anya in Germany, who will tell us about the German OLAR provision, which has been widely regarded as the gold standard, I think, Anya. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, but first, let me just as an introduction very shortly have a look at the original German experimental use exemption, um, which is found in Section 11, Number 2 of the German Patent Act. And it states, much like the original UK exemption, um, the effects of the patent shall not extend to acts done for experimental purposes relating to the subject matter of the patented invention. The most important interpretations of this provision have come in two leading cases of the German Federal Supreme Court, which are called Clinical Trials 1 and Clinical Trials 2 in the late 1990s, and it's still our leading case law nowadays. The understanding of the exemption in these cases appears to differ from that in the UK as regards regulatory approvals. In the first case, Clinical Trials 1, it was held by the Federal Supreme Court that the German Patent Act permits all experiments that serve to gain information and thus carry out a scientific purpose, including those to discover the effects of a substance or possible new uses so far unknown. Hence, it does not matter if the experiments are used to check the statements made in the patent or else to obtain further research results. In particular, the court said that it is immaterial that the experiments are conducted for the purpose of obtaining a pharmaceutical authorization. Compare this to the passage from the Monsanto case uh, that Amanda read. In clinical trials two, the German Federal Supreme Court held that the exemption applies if and insofar as the experiments serve the purpose of exploring the subject matter of the invention. The exemption applies regardless of any additional motivation and purposes that the results might serve. They could range from purely scientific experiment to commercially oriented trials. Similarly to the UK, the use of research tools and conducting bioequivalence tests are not covered because they do not acquire new knowledge in relation to the subject matter of the invention. Also, purposes that are exclusively commercial, such as using the invention in marketing exercises to see if there is commercial demand for it, are not exempted. So now coming to the BOLA exemption, um, how does BOLA make a difference in Germany? BOLA was implemented in 2005 in the Section 11, Number 2, 2B of the German Patent Act. It rules that the effects of a patent shall not extend to studies and trials and the resulting practical requirements necessary for a, obtaining a marketing authorization to place a medicinal product on the market in the European Union or marketing approval for a medicinal product in the member states of the European Union or in third countries. 
So that wording as such is broader than the UK bull exemption. In particular, it does not distinguish between marketing authorizations that are obtained for generic and innovative drugs. Provision also covers studies and trials in so far as they are necessary for obtaining a marketing approval in the European Union and in third countries. Important case law in Germany relates to the question whether the BOLA exemption also applies in the following supply situation. So an API is manufactured in a patent-free European country. In the underlying case, it was Poland. Um, it is then de delivered to a country where the API is patent protected. In the underlying case, it was Germany. However, for the purpose of undertaking trials for the marketing authorization approval only. <clears throat> The position of the Court of Appeals in, in Düsseldorf in its decision of December 5, 2013, in the so-called Paul Pharma case, is very clear. It explains that third-party supply should be allowed <clears throat> for the following reasons. I think we should switch to the next slide, please. Um, starting from the purpose of the directive, which is to enable immediate generic entry and the strengthening of the EU generic industry, it goes on to explain that the wording of the EU BOLA provision allows for flexibility if the purpose of the activity is directed to a privileged purpose. Finally, it states that there would otherwise be a risk of discrimination of the generic companies without own supply. However, as the Bola Directive, as Paul pointed out, is EU law, the Court of Appeals to the law referred the case to the ZGAU. In particular, it asked whether third-party supply for Bola purposes is allowed at all, whether the application of the privilege depends on whether the supply is actually used for the privileged purposes, or whether it could be sufficient that the supplier is in good faith. And finally, it asked which measures the supplier has to take in order to secure that the supply is only used for polar purposes. Um, the case has caused much rumor. However, the CGAU never decided it uh, because the action was withdrawn by the plaintiff. So we do not have a final case law. In summary, um, the implementation of BOLA in Germany is considerably more generous than the implementation of the same provision of the directive in the UK. And it is because of this that the German BOLA exemption has come to be regarded as, as you put it, Paul, something of a gold standard in Europe. Indeed, it is the purpose of the new experimental use exemption in the UK, which Amanda is going to cover soon, to bring the UK much closer to this German gold standard. Thanks very much, Anja. Well, it's interesting uh, that the German experimental use exemption will cover true clinical trials, but not actually bridging studies. But the implementation of BOLAR in Germany clearly seems to make up for that. Uh, so now I want to turn to the Netherlands, and let's ask David what the experimental use and BOLA exemptions look like there. David, over to you. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, I think that the situation in the Netherlands regarding the research exemption at the moment is rather straightforward and may perhaps be compared best to the original experimental research exemption. Okay. That would mean that the exemption is to be interpreted rather narrow. This probably has everything to do with the wording of Article 53 of the Dutch Patent Act. Article says that the exclusive right does not extend to certain acts exclusively done for the purpose of experiments on the patented invention, including products directly obtained by the use of the patent process. So, when a case was brought before the Dutch Supreme Court back in 19 the ICI medical pharma case, the Supreme Court held that there were essentially two ways how this exemption could be used. 
either the research had to be exclusively scientific in nature or the research had to be exclusively pursued in the furtherance of the objective of patent law, which includes investigating whether or not the invention can be put to practical use or further developed. So at the moment this judgment was handed down, Medical Pharma's objective was to bring a generic version of a medicine on the market immediately after expiration of the patent. So making use of the polar exemption as it applies nowadays, which didn't exist under Dutch law back in 1992. According to the Supreme Court, the research exemption then was not to be used for such objectives. So although this judgment and the similar judgment of the Supreme Court three years later in the case of ARS versus Organon have been subject to debate. There remain settled case law uh, up to date. That means there isn't much concrete guidance in the Netherlands. That the question if certain research is permitted or not, therefore, therefore answered most of the time with reference to the objective of the objective is just the objective is justifiable, the research is likely to be exempted. Uh, but this may result in conflicting situations. In the best case scenario, research is conducted purely for the purpose of science, but that isn't reality. In reality, research almost always, at least, has a mixed motive of being both commercial and scientific. It is rather outdated but nevertheless strict interpretation of the Dutch Patent Act, it is hard to give much certainty whether or not certain research is permitted. Also because there almost haven't been any cases dealing with the research exemption since 1994. As a, as a last remark regarding uh, the research exemption, I wanted to note that uh, it may be derived from the judgments of the Supreme Court, that there's also a distinction to be made between research with a better the product and research on a better the product. As a basic rule, research on a better the product would be accepted, but research with a better the product wouldn't be. So with all of that in mind, I think it comes as no surprise that the Bolar exemption 2 is to be interpreted narrowly in the Netherlands. The directive has been debated extensively before it was implemented in the Dutch law, but in the end the Netherlands only implemented the very minimum required under Article 10 of the directive. Therefore, the law is almost a copy of the directive itself. Since the implementation of the Bolar exemption in the Netherlands, the best of our knowledge, there hasn't been a case specifically dealing with the interpretation and scope of the Bowler exemption here. Therefore, like the research exemption, legal professionals lean toward a narrow interpretation of the exemption in accordance with uh, the judgments of the Supreme Court on the research exemption. So that means that only studies conducted in the context of abridged procedures, such as clinical trials with products, are likely to be exempted under the Polar exemption, and only if it concerns studies for the application for marketing authorization within the EU. Perhaps if a case is eventually brought before the Dutch courts, Courts will also take into account how the BOLA exemption is applied in other countries, such as Germany and the UK. Dutch courts are generally sensitive to the way in which the courts in Germany and the UK approach similar questions of, of law, but on the law as it stands, both the research exemption and the BOLA exemption are to be interpreted rather narrowly. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, David. So as I understand it, the Bolar exemption in the Dutch Patent Act seems to take a, a narrower approach resembling that in the UK. Only studies prepared for the purpose of an abridged application for marketing authorization by a generic are covered and only for authorization in the EU. Okay, so let's travel over to Poland now. 
where there's been very recent reform in this area, which Greg Nieska has written about on our Synapse website, but she's here in person to tell us about that now, Agnieszka. Thank you both for this very kind introduction. So um, let's start with the wording. The wording of the experimental use exemption in Poland has not significantly changed since its introduction in 2000. This exempts the use of the invention for research and experimental purposes for its evaluation, analysis, or teaching. Um, it's worth noting that until now there is no relevant case law and this experimental um, research exemption should be likely interpreted by the local court extremely narrowly. Also, the experimental exemption does not cover the use of the patented invention as a research tool. Uh, what's noting is also um, a new development in the Polish law. I mean, the newly introduced farmers and breeders exemption, which exempts using biological material for breeding, discovery, development, new plant variety. It does not exempt the subsequent use of a new variety, discovery, development of a plant variety is not covered by this exemption. The amendment takes into account that the development of biotechnological inventions and the increase in importance of a separate plant variety uh, registration right. Also, this exemption does not exempt the use of a biological material as a research tool. In addition, a new regulation of the compulsory license has been introduced in Poland to allow for the acquisition of the necessary licenses for medicinal purposes, where patented activities prevent research activities. Um, with respect to uh, new developments uh, under Polish law, uh, it's worth noting that the old borrow provision has appeared flexible because it provides that it's not a patent infringement which makes use of the invention to the extent necessary to perform activities which are required by law to obtain registration or authorization which are a condition for the authorization of certain products on the market because of their intended use in particular medicinal products. However, this leaves the unspecified personal scope, territorial reach, or status of medicines and the kind of studies or trials exempt from patent infringement. The very decision of the Polish Supreme Court on 23rd October 2013 confirmed a narrow scope of this regulatory defense as a result of already mentioned complex litigation in Poland and Germany regarding the infringement of the Astella substance patent for solifenacin by a Polish manufacturer of active ingredients. The Supreme Court ruled that the borrower provision only applied to the entity conducting the experiments or trials and did not allow infringing acts committed by third-party suppliers or manufacturers. In more detail, the Supreme Court ruled that the polar provision only applies to generics, not innovators or biosimilar producers. It is limited only to pre-approval activities conducted by the marketing authorization holder and it exempted activities um, only covered uh, by uh, only covered if local regulatory approval is ultimately sought. So, what's new in Poland? The new provision is result uh, of a long time industry battle over the ambiguous scope of the border provision. The amended borrow provision will broaden protection to additionally cover activities conducted for the purpose of obtaining marketing authorization anywhere in the world, including studies on biosimilar or innovative drugs. 
in more detail the new regulatory review defense exam. The borough uh, borough provision is without limitation of territorial scope, which means that exempted activities should be covered by a local exemption regardless of where the regulatory approval is ultimately sought, and thereby export or manufacture substances allowed. A third party which assists a primary party in carrying out preparatory work for regulatory approval benefit from the borrower exemption, provided only that such third party activities are clearly directed and limited to assisting the primary party in seeking regulatory approval. The borrower exemption is limited to those activities which occur prior to regulatory approval. Activities which occur after a competing medicine is approved, but why the relevant patents that cover those activities are still in force, do not implicate this purpose, but instead interfere with core patent rights and undermine the innovation incentives that patents were designed to provide. Lastly, it applies to all qualifying activities, regardless of whether those activities relate to approval of a generic or biosimilar medicine or even a new innovative medicine. Please note that storage of test batches is not covered, is covered by the Bolo exemption, but not storage of commercial batches for launch after patent HPC expires. Also, Clinical trials investigate market potential exceed the new Bola provision in Poland because there is no functional link between the studies and trials on the patented invention and registration purposes of the concrete medicinal product. Well, in practice, there is a question as to what is the line between the experimental use exemption and the Bola exemption. The experimental use exemption in Poland may apply to investigation and development of the innovative medicinal product. In particular, it exempts verification of the characteristics of the patent and genetic sequence, a study to find clinically relevant differences between products, a study to obtain knowledge of the properties and effects of medicines in accordance with the patent in the context of their no medical applications. It also may be possible to research a biotechnological invention or active substance to see how such inventions work. Thanks, Agnieszka. In Poland, Agnieszka, I understand the Supreme Court refused to refer a similar question on the supply of third party API to the CJU to that in the German Paul Pharma case. And I, I think it instead confirmed that third-party supply is not covered by the old Polish implementation of BOLAR. Now, do you think that that may now have changed under the new exemption in Poland? Well, Paul, in fact, the change in law eliminates the unfavorable interpretation of the Supreme Court. The aforementioned judgment of the Polish Supreme Court although issued in an incidental case, was very unfavorable for Polish producers, one may say. Based on the ruling of the Supreme Court, it was easy to secure claims against manufacturers of patented active substances in Poland. So the new provision explicitly stipulates that the use of a protected invention by a third party to register a medicinal product by another company does not infringe the patent. The registrant of a medicine does not have to use the invention oneself in order for such use to be registered without infringing the patent. Also, the new Bola provision provokes some critical comments as it appears the Polish regulation is one of the widest, the most liberal in Europe. Okay, thanks very much, Agnieszka. Um, that's great. So I, I promise we will go back to Amanda uh, in London on a new experimental use exemption uh, that's now in force in the UK. So to bring us up to date on that, uh, can I hand back to you, Amanda? Yes, of course. Thank you, Paul. As as we trailed earlier, the new experimental use exemption arose because of concerns that the UK was losing out on opportunities to conduct work in support of getting marketing authorizations, work such as trials. 
because of the limited UK bowler exemption. Note that we are talking about drugs and pharmaceuticals here. The exemption, new exemption does not, I'm afraid, unlike the original exemption I discussed earlier, cover products other than medicinal products. The new exemption came into force on the 1st of October 2014 by way of an addition to the original exemption. Remember that the original experimental use exemption and the bowler exemption still remain intact despite the addition of this new regime. Although the latter is probably, the bowel exemption is now probably redundant given the, the breadth of the new exception. Um, and the new experimental use provision covers activity that is conducted for the purpose of a medicinal product assessment. A medicinal product assessment is defined as any testing, course of testing, or any other activity undertaken with a view to providing data for purposes which include the following. A, obtaining or varying an authorization to sell or supply or offer to sell or supply a medicinal product, whether in the UK or elsewhere. B, complying with any regulatory requirement imposed, whether in the UK or elsewhere, in relation to such an authorization. C, enabling a government or public authority, whether in the UK or elsewhere, or a person, whether in the UK or elsewhere, with functions of providing health care on behalf of such a government or public authority. So in short, what this means is that the activities of preparing or running clinical trials involving innovative drugs and gaining regulatory approval are exempt. Note also that work undertaken in the UK in support of a regulatory filing in a country that is outside of the EU is also now covered because the exemption explicitly covers acts in the UK or elsewhere. The result is that as far as medicinal product assessments are concerned, the new exemption does not draw the same distinction as the case law that we, we mentioned earlier on agrochemicals. Um, those experiments to verify known properties of a product for a regulatory body will now be covered under this new exemption. Now, Paul, you were asking um, earlier about third-party supply in the context of Poland, and you might be interested in the position in the UK. Of course, until the new provisions are tested, there can be no definitive answer on this. But the exemption for activities conducted for the purpose of a medicinal product assessment would seem to suggest that the provision covers third-party supply of a patented active ingredient, provided it is, it is supplied for such of those exempted purposes. And you know, a UK court may take a very similar approach to the Dusseldorf Court of Appeals interpretation of its bowl of provision when looking at that question. Moreover, the UK IPO has issued guidance on the new experimental use exemption, which states that research tools may be an integral part of a drug therapy, and when they are used in or for the purposes of a medicinal product assessment, they are within the scope of the amendment, i.e. they will fall within the exemption. And now, while this guidance is not precise and it isn't binding, it is obviously the view of the UK IPO that research tools will be covered. But there is an ambiguity in the UK IPO guidance. The new experimental use exemption is intended to apply to post-authorization studies in general, but the guidance states that once the product in question is commercialized, the new experimental use exemption is no longer applicable to research tools. So the use of research tools for post-authorization studies is not entirely clear at this stage. Yeah, okay, thanks, Amanda, that's interesting. I just want to pick up on that question about research tools with David in the Netherlands, because I think you've got some thoughts about that, David, as well. Yes, I do, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also understood that not everyone could hear me very well just now. Um, my apologies for that. I hope this is better. Um, but with regard to your question, I think I indeed already briefly touched upon that earlier. In the Netherlands, it may be derived from the judgment of the Supreme Court in the ICI medical pharma case that there is a distinction to be made between research with a patented product and research on a patented product. And as a basic rule, research on a patented product would be exempted, but research with a patented product uh, would not be exempted. And research on a patented invention which is exempted might include investigating the application of the patented invention itself, such as investigating whether a patented invention 
can be exploited before taking out the license. Um, investigating new uses, such as further medical indications of a patented invention, and uh, it might also include investigating further improvements of the patented invention. Uh, research with the patented invention, which is not exempted, might include the use of a patented invention in research on separate new inventions. So this would be the case if the patented invention is used as a tool to make new inventions with. So I want to note that this distinction was only indirectly touched upon in the ICI Medical Pharma and uh, ARS Organon judgments of the Supreme Court in uh, 1992 and 1995, but it has not really played a visible role in the Netherlands in uh, more recent case law. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thanks very much, David. Now then, uh, and thanks everyone else for explaining the situation nationally. That's very helpful. And it brings us on to a more international question about the impact of the Unified Patent Court on the Bolar exemption. Although, well, given the current status of the UPC project at the moment, we don't know when this will become a real issue. And I also need to just, of course, mention Brexit. Let's deal with Brexit first, because I think this can be dealt with quite briefly. Um, because as, as you've heard, the OLAR exemption, although based on an EU directive, is implemented in UK statute in the Patents Act 1977. And furthermore, as Amanda explained, Although the OLAR exemption remains on the UK statute book, for all intents and purposes, it's probably superseded by the new experimental use exemption in the UK. And that's also UK law too. So the only difference that Brexit may bring, depending on the result of the future relationship negotiations that have just started, is that the UK is likely to be unaffected by any subsequent reform on the BOLAR exemption in the EU and may uh, decide to do its own thing. Now, as regards the UPC, the BOLAR exemption is in fact implemented by the UPC agreement expressly as one of the limitations of the effects of a patent in Article 27D. That provision is drafted by reference to the directive, and so it's very similar to the narrow implementation of BOLAR in the UK and the Netherlands that you've been hearing about. How will the UPC interpret it? Well, the UPC would, I'm sure, refer questions to the CJU for a preliminary ruling, and it would be surprising, I think, if the CJU were to interpret the exemption any more broadly than the clear and limited application that it has on its face to activities conducted for the purpose of abridged marketing applications. That would also imply that the exemption applies only to authorizations for the purpose of marketing in the European Union. So as far as decisions on unitary patents and patents that are not opted out of the UPC are concerned, the scope of BOLAR protection is likely to be more limited than in, say, Germany, Poland, or under the new experimental use exemption in the UK. So, with that, let me summarise all the issues we've discussed in this webinar. I think we can say that the application and development of the experimental use exemption and then the BOLAR exemption in national law has been fairly haphazard. The experimental use exemption is applied differently, sometimes subtly, in different courts, and BOLAR, despite being intended to harmonise protection from patent infringement of certain work conducted in the pharmaceutical field, has not brought a harmonised approach across Europe. So the UK has responded to that divergence by amending its Patent Act to provide an exemption to infringement for clinical studies and related work conducted for the purpose of a wide-ranging class of medicinal product assessments. And in doing so, it's consciously followed Germany as the gold standard. 
and Poland has made similar changes to its law. However, just as this has happened, of course, the drafting of Article 27D of the UPC Agreement suggests that the interpretation of BOLAR in that forum, should it come into force, will stick closely to the narrow wording of the directive. And that would apply, as I just said, to all European patents litigated in the UPC and all unitary patents. So with those conclusions, I hope we've given you a helpful steer today on the coverage of the experimental use and BOLAR exemptions in some important European countries. And let me thank my colleagues again, Amanda Ebert, Anja Luntzer, David Mulder, and Agnieszka Stoltman. And we will hopefully speak again soon. Please remember, before you go, to answer the survey that will pop up on your screens in a moment. And thanks very much indeed for listening. Goodbye.